One of the coolest things in Magic the Gathering is when a character from the old lore gets an actual card. Greetings, owners of fine luxury cardboard rectangles. We are here today for what I like to call a spoil lore video, where we take a look at a brand new card, we break it down, and then take a look at the actual whole history of the card, the story behind it. So what we're going to be doing today is talking about Mangara. Now I know some of you may be saying to yourself, wait, Mangara technically got a card in Time Spiral. That is like an alternate reality style set, and we'll touch on that card at the end just to like cover our bases. But in all honesty, this Mangara that's on the screen right now, the Mangara the Diplomat, he's the one who actually matches the old magic lore. And I gotta be real. There's some cool lore about Mangara. When when you go back to old school sets like uh, Mirage, the characters from them, like this is actually the main character of the Mirage storyline. People don't realize, like he's a big deal. There's a whole bunch of story about him, but there were no novels for this. So it's just kind of like buried bits here and there. And honestly, I've uncovered a bunch of it, and it's this big sprawling story that I intend to at some point do a lore series about, but I figure what we'll do, we'll take a look at the way this card works, and then we'll talk about kind of like an, an overview of what happens with Mangara from start to finish roughly, and then later on we can go back and have a full on meaty lore session with it, you know? So, Mangara the Diplomat is one white and three for a 2-4 human cleric with lifelink. Whenever an opponent attacks with creatures, if two or more of those creatures are attacking you and or planeswalkers you control, draw a card. That is a little bit of a departure from old school wording, but it does still seem clear enough that it's not a problem. I don't know when they make these template changes, if it's because it makes it easier to parse it into arena programming, or if it's just kind of like a trait of the people who are designing the cards, like depending on who writes out the card, that will determine the wording to a degree. I don't know exactly how they make those changes, but either way, it breaks down to whenever your opponent swings on you with two or more creatures and they're coming at you or one of your planeswalkers, you get to draw a card. And whenever an opponent casts their second spell each turn, draw a card. Now it's interesting to note that this is a, a reimagining, a reshaping, that's the right word, a reshaping of the color pie in terms of how white operates. And white honestly needs color pie reshaping. This is, co the color pie, if you don't know what it is, basically each color in Magic has its own abilities and concepts that belong to it, right? Like green is very creature heavy, you'll notice doesn't have flying. There's certain things each color can and, can, can and can't do, like black and red have an extremely hard time dealing with enchantments, for example. So. One of White's like main concepts is rule setting, where they say, you can't do this. And you know, there's a ton of different White cards that say that, like you can't do this. But they've expanded that concept a bit to change the rule setting into not you can't do this, but if you do this, then I get a card. So instead, instead of stopping you outright, your punishment for doing, for transgressing White's rules is that White gains resources from it. So we've got two different scenarios on this card that both add up to what could be some serious card advantage. I mean, basically it's saying, as long as you only cast one spell a turn, and as long as you only attack with one creature at a time, then we're okay. But if you try and do more than that, then I get something out of the deal. That's, that's the operation, and that does have a diplomatic feel to it. But let's dive in to the story about Mangara, and we can see just how much this card actually fits because I got to say it feels pretty decent so to understand what's going on with this you need to know that the region this is happening in is Jamura okay now that's not where Mangara is actually from Mangara is from Karandor which is about 2,000 miles north of the actual area where he ends up living moving to like basically the whole story that we have is centered around when Mangara has come to Jamura from Karandor. So he lived in Karandor originally, and where he was friends with the Quirion elves, living a very sort of like relaxed and peaceful life. He is actually, basically, he was raised up by the most benevolent planeswalker there ever was. It's, um, we'll, we'll talk about that planeswalker another time. We don't really need to get into the details of him, but it's important to know 
that Mangara was raised by a benevolent planeswalker, right? So, how did Mangara end up coming to Jamura? That actually involves Teferi. The very short way of putting it is, Teferi was involved in a number of experiments with time. Those experiments went wrong. Teferi felt guilty for what had happened. As a result, he attempted to undo the effects of his time magic, and the resultant energies from that actually removed Teferi's entire island? He was basically on one island in a chain of islands in the Jamura area, right? So his magic that he pulled together to try and fix what he had done instead blinked his entire island out of existence, like out of phase with time. So it still existed, but couldn't be interacted with. Now magic this powerful sends ripples out across an entire plane. And there were some very powerful mages who picked up on that ripple. The three of them actually came together. The three most important biggest names were Mangara, Kervik, and Joel Rail. So obviously we've talked a little bit about Mangara. Kervik was a black and red aligned, very, very evil, narcissistic, unpleasant individual who lorded over spirits and death. And Joel Rail was originally, at least presumed to be, a resident of Jamura who had actually left her homeland to just spend her time bonding with animals. She doesn't actually connect properly with people or understand their motivations. But the three of these mages came together and understand their power level was such that they lived for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years. They had used magic that essentially slowed their aging to a crawl. So these are three mages with extreme power, very long lives, and a breadth of magical knowledge. They agreed that the three of them, they basically met together on the spot where Teferi's island had been. It's gone now, just barren rock. The whole thing disappeared. So they stood there and agreed that they would all end up working together to kind of try and parse out what the mystery was. So Mangara decided he was going to settle, obviously, directly in Jamura, but there was a problem. There are three different warring nations in this area. There's the Zalfirans, who were essentially a military organization. There was the Femrif, who started out as a part of Zalfir, but eventually splintered off as their own religious province. And then there's the Sukata, who are basically traitors. So you had one group of military individuals, one group of religious individuals, and a group of merchants, essentially, as these three different societies that were at war. So basically, like, they're, it's not like they were at full all-out conflict with each other, but Mangara refused to exist in an area that didn't have calm and peace. So he basically went about dealing with the rival nations. Now, Mangara was already well-versed in both diplomacy and intimidation before he even left Karandor. So he didn't have a lot of difficulty kind of just knocking people into place, you know, either through obviously saying, hey, you know what, I'll hook you up with this, or don't do this, or there, or X will happen, right? And that does have a very white mana kind of feel to it. So essentially, Mangara was able to cause the formation of peace agreements amongst these nations. However, there were still hostilities between the militarized Zalfirans and the religious Femerif. So Mangara basically got a bunch of the Quirion elves from, from the area that he lived in previously, to migrate into a safety kind of buffer barrier. But like, they cut off a piece of land along the disputed borders between the Zalfirans and the Femerifs. And they went ahead and said, okay, this land is specifically Quirion land now. And they filled it with a whole bunch of elves. And the elves are clearly quite pleased to be here. They have no problems with it. It's a situation that works out quite well for everyone, in fact. The, um, this basically, it led, it led to Mangara ruling over the area for over a hundred years with no real problems. And by ruling over, it was really just a matter of keeping the peace. He wasn't like an actual leader. He didn't declare himself a king or anything like that. And the time that he brought about, the hundred years or so of peace, while he was actually there negotiating these treaties and such, it was known as Mangara's Harmony. So he had a big impact on the area. Now the problem is, as I mentioned before, Kervik is an awful person. So Kervik was there. Now Kervik had always wanted to form a nation of his own. And he saw what was happening with Mangara. 
and he was jealous, but also Kervik was so warped and twisted that he couldn't perceive of someone like Mangara doing what he was doing for the greater good. I mean, yes, underneath it all, you could say that there were some selfish ambitions of Mangara in terms of him just saying, you know what, I'm going to instill my order and peace on you guys. There is like a little bit of ego involved with that, but regardless, Mangara had no intent to rule over the people, but Kervik saw it differently. He saw what Mangara was doing and he considered it a threat. He figured that Mangara was just lying to consolidate power and at some point he was gonna turn on everyone. And the reason that Kervik thought that is because that's the kind of person he is, right? Uh, he's, he's obviously just a complete scumbag. <laughs> that, that becomes very apparent. So basically Kervik turns to Joel Rail. He goes and discusses with Joel Rail who is not, again, not very familiar with the ways of humans because she spends all her time with beasts. So Kervik doesn't have a hard time convincing Jolrel that actually Mangara is a big threat. So at that point, Jolrel and Kervik both secretly create armies. Kervik is raising armies of spirits while Jolrel is getting like armies of forest beasts raised up and ready. So the next step in the plan that Kervik had was for him to sow discord amongst the different nations, right? And in this in this scenario, the it's just kind of like little things here, little things there, until all of a sudden it escalates to the point where there's actual like there's actual violence going on, right? And then at that point, it basically comes to the brink of all-out conflict. Mangara at this point, exactly according to Kervik's plan, he's at his wit's end. He doesn't know what to do. All the tactics that he's used up to this point that have been successful are no longer working. Dis diplomacy and intimidation are both failing him. And at this point, that's when Kervik sends Mangara a message saying, I understand what's going on with you, let me offer some aid. And at that point, Mangara says, okay, I'm gonna go out, I will meet with you and Joel Rail. They will actually, Mangara only agrees to meet with Kervik, but he's ambushed by both Joel Rail and Kervik, and they force him, they force him into the Amber Prison. The Amber Prison is the, I mean, there's literally, there's literally an artifact card. You can see it, like, it's up on the screen now. Karavik is actually stuck inside of the Amber there. So he's all shrunk down and trapped in this giant Amber rock. Well, not giant, it's hand-sized, right? But either way, I mean, it still would be a pretty big gem with a powerful wizard trapped inside of it. How, ins how insane is that? That jewel was then put on display in Joel Rail's palace, where it remained for about a hundred years. Mangara was imprisoned for about a hundred years and he hadn't even done anything wrong. You know what I mean? Like Mangara at this point had committed no crimes. This was completely against him. So he's trapped in this amber prison for a hundred years until Teferi actually returns, right? At this point, nobody knows Mangara. Nobody knows what happened to Mangara. He's basically imprisoned in Joe Royal's palace. All of his people just thought that Mangara abandoned them because of all the civil unrest, right? So Teferi returns with his island after 200 years of being gone, sees what's going on with everything in the world and sets out to try and make it right. He enlists the help of Azmira and some other individuals and together they end up actually freeing Mangara from his prison. And that pretty much ends the storyline for Mangara. When we take a look at the Mangara card as a diplomat, I mean, this card, it makes perfect sense. If you're trying to do too much, casting too many spells, you're trying to swing with too many creatures, that would be like you're violating the different treaties and penalties have to be paid and sanctions and all this, like all that sort of political stuff that is incredibly actually boring in real life. It's really not very interesting, but conceptually it all ties together. And when you take a look at the art of Mangara, you can see like, he's obviously somewhere nice. You know what I mean? In terms of his location, he's he's in some location that obviously would cost a bit of money to put together. Look at that, like, little pillar statue behind him and the gigantic monolith pillar behind him. The, 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 like, the quality of the cloth on his chair and everything. It gives kind of a, it's like simple opulence where he's willing to accept a certain level a certain level of like living where it's like, okay, I'm not going to be in dirty rags and whatever. And part of that's going to be for appearances, right? You're going to want to actually, if you're meeting with other dignitaries, you can't show up all shabby. So he has to look nice. But at the same time, you can see that what he has here, 
he's not adorned with like there's no jewelry he doesn't have like big flowing gold chains there isn't ornate braiding in like embroidery in his clothing and even his chair is probably just some regular chair with a fine piece of cloth draped over it to be sufficient and you can see he's got like papers flowing all over the place he's like basically in the middle of like writing a treaty he's got pen and paper and he just he's sitting there with this kind of like proud stance it seems it honestly the card fits very very well for me so this is a cool card to see that fits into a cool part of magic's history i'm definitely happy about this spoiler card and i did say earlier we would talk about the other version of mangara where things had basically alternate timeline styled and so this is Morang uh, Moranga, <laughs> Mangara, which I'm sure I've said a couple different ways in the video. Pronounce it however you want. Mangara of Karandor. Two white and one for a 1-1 one, one legendary human wizard. Tap him, exile Mangara of Karandor, and target permanent. And it says, I've been brought to this place and I cannot leave. I may be free of the amber, but I'm still in prison. So basically, Mangara has been pulled out. Of this is before he would have been rescued by his Mira and Teferi. And... You've got a situation where he has been pulled out of the Ember Prison, but he's been brought to some desolate wasteland. I mean, look, there's no buildings, there's nothing in sight. This feels like the moment that Mangara has appeared. You know what I mean? Like, he goes from thinking that he's going to meet with Karavik to find a solution to fix the unrest that's going on in his part of the world. Instead, he gets betrayed by, by Joel Rail and Karavik, put in the prison, the next thing he knows, because I assume while you're in the prison, you're not aware of anything. The, the next thing he knows, all of a sudden, he's in some barren wasteland with dark foreboding skies where lightning is just smashing down into the ground. And he reaches down to try and feel a link with the earth. And all he finds is blasted ash. And you can see him like reach down, pick it up, and it's just flowing off of his fingers and he's not even looking at it like he doesn't want to accept the reality or he's looking around wildly to try and figure out what's going on while he's all hunched over in this defensive looking position with his cloak flapping up the mood of this card is amazing and to address some question you may have the fact that he's a human cleric on the new version and he's a human wizard on this one wizards has decided to expand out the, the creature types because they want to have each color have its own specific like caster type so cleric is the caster type for white wizard is the caster type for blue so in most cases we're going to see a shift of creature type professions in that manner now i'm curious let me know what you think about all this are you interested in more in more mangara lore because I'm going to do more. I'm going to be doing a ton more lore. I've, I've got a whole big sweeping lore series that I'm working on. I've actually been putting out weekly lore videos and I have a full on lore playlist. So if you want to hear more magic stories, check that out. Make sure to subscribe and click the like, do all that goodness. And if you want to support the channel, this channel is community funded. So go ahead and jump on my Patreon. It's the best way to support the channel. Thanks for coming by, everybody. I'll see you all real soon.